and uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Joe Blakey, who is an environmental and political geographer. Um, gives social challenges of human environmental relations and post carbon futures and uh, the so called net zero. I think we'll hear about that. Um, carbon cities and uh, carbon accountability. And uh, Aurora Friedrichsen, uh, a social and cultural geographer working on ethics and politics of sharing space with others, human and non-human. Um, so yeah, we have some very excellent discussants as well as the panel. So um, I think, did I let you guys just have a, a, a couple of minutes just to reflect on what you've heard already, then we'll take some questions from the floor, if that's okay. Um, uh, let's go first, Aurora. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for those three brilliant presentations. So that was really a lot to, to think about and some really nice examples of local change, local sort of efforts to think about these transitions uh, during this time of sort of planetary emergency. Um, I'm, it, one thing that I work on is the kind of local experience of kind of planetary change, but also the, the sort of trade-offs between different local places around the world. So if I might sort of start with a, a kind of provocative, very geography question. Um, in each of your cases, we saw something really positive or at least sort of aspirational at this local place. I wonder how you sort of think about the trade-offs with other local places around the globe. So for example, thinking about solar panels, having a really positive impact in one place, but causing, you know, relying on a sort of rare earth mining and potentially very terrible factory processes in another place or in the construction field, the sort of, uh, you know, we're now aware of the kind of dredging of sand or the impacts of concrete in other local places around the world. And so how we might think about that balance between um, the local place that we're looking at and looking at positive changes and the potential sort of off-staged local problems that that might cause elsewhere around the world. <laughs> we'll just give a look at um, I mean, I can go for briefly it. touch on that. So I, I think I mentioned, but I think, I think there needs to be a balance. Um, I don't think, uh, I think rare earth mining is a problem, but I don't think it's a justification for not investing in this technology. Rather, I think that this is what we have now, so we should use it while we continue investing in more efficient solar panels. So solar panel technology in the last five, 10 years, has, it, the advances are incredible. And I feel like if we were just investing more into it and we were bringing in more corporations and more governments and we stopped being so wishy-washy with regulations where you know, one year it's legal and then the next year it's illegal and then what are people actually doing with, with these technologies? Um, I think we could get a lot further. But also, I'm a huge proponent of sustainability should not be a luxury and currently it is. But if we look at developing countries, if we look at these very small rural communities, they're using techniques that they've been using for hundreds of years to kind of mitigate a lot of these problems. So yes, heat is a big problem in places like Manchester, but I'm from the Yucatan. It's like 50 degrees in the summer. We've lived with, I've lived with that my entire life. And what the Mayans have done is they, they construct their houses um, in a circle with open doors. They're not using solar panels. They're not using air conditioning. They can't afford it. Instead, they're using like natural airflow. And so what I think is that we need to integrate technological advances, but also less techie, but also technological architecture that already exists. And we need to stop looking at is innovation and a luxury and rather what do we already have and what can we leverage to our advantage moving forward. I hope we pick up on, on that one in terms of, yeah, fully, fully appreciating that actually it's not just about sticking tech on, mm -hmm. on, on everything. And tech has, has its place, and absolutely. Controls, management, um, all of those things, but also it, for construction, it's about making sure that we're using those materials as best as we can. So off-site manufacture is a really nice opportunity because you are not doing it in the rain or the snow and 
throwing bricks in, in, in the skip because it didn't look right. You're doing it in a much more controlled um, kind of environment and you're putting a lot more of the quality um, into that. And that's the other thing is that we need to be building from, from housing perspective, it needs to be a quality that is going to last. It is not a temporary solution. When we talk about climate resilience, it's talking about um, now, but also the, that changing climate. So again, passive passive opportunities, learning from you know uh, you know shutters or multiple openings, um, overhangs, you know all of these kind of type of things. They're you know architecturally very well understood. But just not implemented because it's that it comes back to the, the point made earlier about we've always done it this way, we don't want to change, and actually that disruption is really important. Just just quickly about this, and obviously, you know, cycling infrastructure is not something that has massive environmental impact. You don't need to you'll be mining more than than it's, it's in a way it's degrowth. You know, you, you use your roads more, you know, in a less less resource intensive way, but. You know, it's not necessarily places on the other side of the world that are going to lose out. It's also at a micro scale, a really local scale that you have winners and losers. So if you have a serious cycling policy to really improve a sustainable modes, well, you're going to also have to do something about cars. Mm -hmm. And so drivers are going to have to lose out in some ways. You know, they, they may gain in others, and you know, the people that actually rely on a car can also be facilitated in that way. But um, for instance, within Manchester, a lot of the house building I've seen, it's going on. It's, it's going on on the periphery, you know. And even outside of the borders of Greater Manchester, in Cheshire, they're building massive houses um, in the Wilmslow area, and you know that just we can't keep doing that. So even within these local scales, there'll be there'll be winners and losers within that space. It's not just on the other side of the world. It's also within our own communities. We have to think about the trade-offs of these changes. Yeah. I might jump in with one more small question before I take up all the space, but just, uh, Thomas, your question really leads on to a, another question I had, which is, uh, you know, within a local space, you know, it's all well and good, you know, consulting people, it's so important because, you know, you don't want to do something that people don't want and won't use. What do you do with a local community that when they, you sort of consult them and what they want is, Drilling oil. I'm from the US. What do you do when the local community wants a new coal mine in the UK or something that, you know, cars, for example, of course, has this sort of uh, a lot of local communities are feel that cycling is this kind of thing for middle class people. It's not for them and, and they want cars. So in your research, how have you found these kind of tricky spots of when local communities or disadvantaged communities don't really want to do the kind of climate positive or sustainable thing because they feel it's not for them or it's not in their interests um, on a sort of micro scale. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up. I mean, it's, it's not my main focus of research and I recognize there's a lot of work being done on this topic and there's a lot of things I, I don't know about this. But just in terms of examples from the places I've been looking at, uh, don't do referendums. It's number one, it's not a referendum. You know, you, you had this congestion charge referendum here in, 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 in Manchester. That doesn't work. You know? It's not a popularity contest. It's a process, right? So consultation is not just asking, do you want this or not? It's, it's a process of working together with the community. And, and there's different ways this is done in, in different places. And in many ways, I think Toronto shows the good sides and bad sides of a very local democracy. Because if the local councillor is against a bike lane project, against a, a cycling project, it's not going to happen. And um, local councillors have a massive incumbency advantage. So it's, it's, there's, a, there's like a conservative tendency there. Um, but then when you get a, when the councillor changes, it can be a great way to actually work with the community and get changes in. So they've been extending some of these bike lanes now into traditionally very car heavy, very uh, conservative areas. I don't know if anyone knows of um, Rob Ford, the Ford brothers, kind of those areas of Toronto. Uh, and they've recently elected some progressive councillors, and and now that change is happening. Consultations are ongoing, but again, it's not it's not a popularity contest. It's not going up to a vote. Um, so yeah, more processes of of working together with the people rather than uh, some kind of one-time vote. That's what I would say. Yeah. Thank you.
add to that. Oh, sorry. I'm very quick. <laughs> um, I add to that about um, it, it's about people, and particularly with housing, it's about talking the language that resonates with people. So um, I quite often <laughs> rant about polar bears being used as like the image of talking about climate change. Um, in the UK, we don't have native bears, <laughs> so why, why is it on lots of things? You know, it's, it's not appropriate. You need to be talking about um, things that matter to people. So with social housing, it's, it's paying the rent. It's being able to um, heat your home as well as put food on the table for your children. So it's about how can we enact that so that people, it resonates with people, and so we can then have that as kind of an acting change. But change is hard, change is challenging. Some people are will be kind of early kind of um, engagers with it. Um, some are kind of slightly more you know, hesitant. And it is this, as cliched as it is, it is a journey about you know, getting, getting everyone to kind of come along um, and different people will come at, at different stages. So for me, it's about language, how we communicate it to, to talk through that. Great, um, can we go to Joe? Sure. Um, I mean, firstly, again, thank you very much. I've, I've really, really enjoyed uh, all three of your talks, and I thought they mapped on together really, really well. Uh, main reflection I've got is you've all done such a good job of highlighting how context matters and how thinking contextually and getting right contextually really, really matters. Um, I made tons of notes, which I will spare you all. Um, so I will be, I will be selective. So I've got maybe three reflections for you. The first of which is that I really like brown sauce. Um, so I was, I was a little more than that, but yeah, I do like brown sauce. But seriously, um, Alexandra, I think your talk in particular, I think you highlighted that point about the many meanings net zero can have. Um, and in the context of my research and what I'm interested in, I think that's really, really significant. I mean, notably in what you said, you highlighted um, the assumptions around offsetting and negative emissions technologies and the extent to which people might rely on them is one area of that that's maybe a little bit grey and a little bit woolly in the, in the definition that we have. Um, the other thing we could think about is the scope of emissions that we're talking about. I mean, here it's so easy to go straight to consumption and think about consumption as a possible oversight. Uh, but we might also think about investment. I think that's arguably even more significant, but something that we really don't often, often talk about. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to raise, maybe as a question back to you all, is, I mean, the theme of this session is around the local, right, and the significance of the local. And the local clearly matters from everything that you've all, all, all said. But what are the limits to thinking locally? When is it not appropriate to think about the local? Um, I think typically in policy discourse, it seems to be aviation and shipping that get raised the most as, oh, we can't think about them locally, can't be leakage, that kind of thing. So, you know, is there anything you could do about that to make that local, but or is, there, is, there, is, there, is, there, is there value in that argument? And then also, I was thinking about Manchester, right? Manchester is the, uh, I think it's the most, it's got the most amount of millionaires outside of London in the UK. It's also one of the most unequal cities um, we know that uh, the rich are overwhelmingly responsible for lots of lifestyle or scope three, three related emissions. Um, so do we sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot by thinking locally? Should we be thinking through some of these other metrics or, or in tandem or in, uh, instead of? So yeah, that's my provocation if you like. <laughs> okay, well, uh, back to brown sauce. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't trying to start an international incident there. But um, so one of my PhD supervisors, um, you might have heard of him, his name is Oliver Lash. And something that Oliver does really, really well is he takes two kind of contrasting concepts and meshes them together and then comes up with a new word. And the words aren't always great, but one of the ones that we use in our research group is global. So. <laughs> I don't love it, but it kind of makes the point where they're not contradicting ideas necessarily. We have to find a way to, you know, make them work. And so with things like the shipping industry, when it's affecting several locals, we kind of do have to have main regulations in place while adapting to those localities, if that makes sense. So. I think it just it goes back to what we've kind of been hammering nonstop, which is context matters. Context is so, so, so important, but we still need these kind of grand challenges, grand goals, because without them, we're going to have a lot of disparity in what we're trying to achieve um, at, at, at a local level, and that just doesn't work. So. Yes, yeah, so, so I would say to that, um, as a geographer, 
there is no local without the global. Every, every local is in, is in dialogue with the global. And there's a ton of different skills between that. You know, it's very hard to even define what is local. You know, so I think the question of scale is essential, but it's also always very fleeting and very hard to grasp. Um, something I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with in my research right now, and hopefully I have something to say about it. But, um, but yeah, the kind of the, the construction of a scale to govern the local is, is critical. But then you can wonder whether a city region like Greater Manchester is actually the right scale at which to address a question like, like cycling. Um, it might be good for some things, but then it doesn't work in other things. And there's different kinds of systems, and each place will have a, have a diff different system in place. And you can never have an ideal scale of governance either. You have legacy institutions, you have to work within those. Um, but yeah, there's always this dialogue with kind of globally circulating ideas, and I think that's, that kind of translation from the global to the local is, 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 is just critical. Um, and just to your point about uh, kind of what else is going on, you know, what the, the, the lifestyles and, and, and consumption. I mean, all the points I, I talked about, about gentrification, you know, there's the whole displacement part of it, which in the U.S. is, is particularly important discourse. But then there's also, you know, who's, what are lifestyles of those people moving in? You know, that cycling about, but if you're going on a bunch of foreign holidays, you know, you can live car free, but then fly around the world. Well, you, you, the, the net zero is uh, it's still net very high, right? So um, the Netherlands is another amazing example. I mean, everyone thinks there's no, no cars in the Netherlands. Well, actually, it's not, not the case at all. We have the highest density of motorways in, in Europe. So, yeah, I, again, I think I introduced the, the talk saying, you know, cycling is presented as this environmental idea, but this, really the, the emissions impact, I think, is, is, rather, is, is overstated often, and, and there's a lot of other things that are going on, and, and certainly uh, uh, the consumption of, 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 the, of the rich is, is, is a massive issue there. Yeah. <laughs> so touching on kind of housing, um, housing in particular, you know, transcends so, so many different levels, but what matters to people is that they have somewhere safe and secure that they can, they can you know, shut the door and, and kind of be safe in that environment. So you have all these, these multiple levels of, you know, UK government saying we need 300,000 new homes, but actually we're not doing that, but we need, we need all these homes. And, you know, if you look at the local need in terms of the, the plan that GMCA, so Greater Manchester Combined Authority put out, that only has nine of the 10 boroughs. <laughs> so one of the boroughs has stepped out from that in terms of the strategic plan for housing for Greater Manchester. So you have a sort of level of agreement and then a almost, I don't want to use the word rogue, but <laughs> it's stuck out, um, you know, authority who have stepped out and said, well, actually we do need to do it at the local level and it's the local, you know, city uh, kind of council area. So, you know, housing covers up, you know, everywhere, but it also matters at, matters at the local level. And when you get to the kind of micro level, it matters to the people who are going to be in those homes. And that's when that engagement and that discussion, communication and language is, is really part of the piece that needs to take place. Great. Um, thank you. We'll open the floor to take some more questions, which I'm sure we have. Um, they can be to uh, speakers or to the panel. Um, do you have any questions from in the room? Uh, at the back? Yes, I had a specific question focused on cycling, but I think you can broaden out, which is around electrification. And I guess from the cycling perspective, obviously, the electrification of e scooters and e bikes will change the way that's used. But I guess also that, that question spans out into the other areas of how, you know, how, how does this growth of electrification? Yeah, so just in terms of cycling, I mean, I think it can revolutionize what cycling even is, and, and, and if it, specifically in terms of cycling infrastructures, you know, we're building things right now that in 10 years may have very different vehicles circulating on them, and it's already happening in the Netherlands. It's, uh, the amount of uh, electric micromobility has is, 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 is really taken off, and uh, that has a lot of good impacts, but it also has some negative impacts. And, and certainly in, in the bigger cities, the bike lanes are just too small now. You know, cycling in Amsterdam was never a, a lot of fun. You know, it's probably the worst place to cycle in the Netherlands. But now it's, it's, it's crazy with all these uh, electric, uh, electric scooters and a lot of kids, you know, teenagers actually using them. They don't really need them, but, uh, but yeah. And on the other hand, you, um, a lot of elderly 
people in the Netherlands have started using e-bikes to get out of the city and just explore the countryside. There's a lot of bike lanes in the, in, in the rural areas as well. But that's actually led to, the first time in decades, cycling deaths have gone up in the Netherlands. And that's exclusively elderly people on e-bikes. Um, not crashing with cars, but crashing by themselves. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's... What, what weighs more, you know, getting people outside or a couple of deaths, you know? It's hard to say, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's, it creates new problems, basically. So while it may be solving solutions, it's also creating new problems. But certainly in cities with more hilly topography, you know, the east, north Manchester, it, it's, it's definitely a game changer. Um, yeah, well, from a policy uh, perspective, it, to me, the kind of electric vehicle revolution is very reminiscent of like early vehicle days where we didn't really have any safety regulations we didn't really have the infrastructure for it and i think it needs to be viewed as that as a new thing a new entity i i do think people should have to as bad as it, the system is some kind of license some kind of regulation to drive an electric vehicle because like a car it is extremely dangerous you are putting yourself and other people at risk um, I think it comes with a whole new kind of uh, just group of issues. For example, the batteries that we use in these electric vehicles, they're not specifically, they're not sustainable. We tote them as sustainable, but you know, you can use 20, you, a battery reaches its end use life and it still has 80% of that life left and we just have to recycle them because of regulations. But why aren't we taking these batteries and using them for something else? like? farm equipment for uh, government infrastructures or, I don't know, something, I don't work in tech. But my point is, um, I think it comes with a new host of things and we can't just treat it as an add-on. We can't treat it as a loophole. I lived in China for eight years and they have existing infrastructure for that, um, but not the regulation necessary. So there's a lot of accidents, there's a lot of deaths, there's a lot of people getting hurt, there's a lot of traffic congestion, and there's an increase in emissions, not a decrease. <laughs> um, I think for electrification in, in housing, one of the things we haven't really touched on is um, the energy markets and the energy costs. Um, I think I touched on about how gas is cheaper than electricity. If we're moving to an electrified future, that whole system um, needs, to be, needs to be addressed so that actually financially everyone is, is then incentivized to, to do that. We also have then the kind of connectivity to the grid, um, you know. So there's there's many kind of different different levels, but definitely, you know, for me, for social housing, that electrification, you know, is definitely a, a, a positive, you know, from a decarbonisation perspective. But I think from a financial perspective, right now, right here, it just doesn't it doesn't add up, and it will put more financial burden. But that system can potentially change and in my opinion it should it should change to enable enable that electrification. Um, do you have any other questions from the, the room? Yes. Hi, thanks. I have a question for the cycling paper and then a comment more maybe for everyone if you wanted to react. So on the cycling, you know what I happened to be in Toronto earlier in the year and I saw an ad, you must find it if you don't know of it on the TV. It was for car insurance. And it showed a crazy motorway crossing with loads of cars. And then the voiceover said, car insurance makes the world go round. And they said, without car insurance, the world would stop. And the picture changed. And you have the same roads with nobody on it except a person on a bike. Right? And I thought, wow. So in the North American mindset, the end of the world is someone's right? So it kind of got me thinking when you were talking, because I think from one of the cities, I forgot which you, you mentioned that policymakers were also talking about changing mindsets around cycling. If this is something, you know, to kind of overcome this. I mean, for me, it's an I love really beautiful utopia to think people cycling all the way. So kind of, do they actively talk about changing mindsets around biking, or is that something that they've made a decision not to do, or kind of do explore this with them? Yeah. And it's my question. I mean, it's a really broad topic. I mean, you think cycling is this small issue, but you can go all kinds of directions with it. Personally, I'm focusing on infrastructure, infrastructure policy. So there's a whole cultural, social, political kind of aspect to it, which is linked to what I'm researching, but it's not particularly my focus. Uh, in each of these cities, 
culture change is, is an important, important issue. And I think Mexico City was the example I showed where the siting of the infrastructures was specifically targeted to get like young professionals, middle classes on bikes to change the image of the bike because it was very much associated with the urban poor. In Toronto, the problem is maybe the opposite. The, the, the bike is associated with the downtown pinkos, as, uh, as the ex-mayor, Rob Ford, used to, used to call them. Uh, so yeah, it's more like, oh, that's the liberals, that's those progressives that are downtown, you know, us in the suburbs, we, we don't want anything to do with that. So the challenge is actually now more like the downtown suburb divide. Here in Manchester in the UK, you've also got a lot of kind of oppositional discourse around cycling. Whether that's as spatially distributed as, as it is in those other cities, I'm not sure. Um, so maybe a bit different than those cases I showed. Um, but yeah, I mean certainly, like the culture change is. But what comes first, right? Is it it's the chicken or the egg? Often they call it like infrastructure or cycling, cycling culture, infrastructure. What comes first? And you can't really have one without the other. Um, so a lot of the hope is that putting in infrastructure will change the culture, and in Mexico City, it certainly it has it has had the effect. You know, the young professionals are are using bikes in much bigger numbers than they used to before. In Toronto, whether whether the bike lanes and the suburbs really are making impact, that's. Uh, but yeah, this it's 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 a massive question. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any final reflections on that last point from the rest of the panel? Okay, <laughs> Great. Um, well, it's time for lunch, so can we uh, show our appreciation to the panel and the speakers?